Thank you very much. I'm really very excited to be here to honor three very special, great songwriters, producers who made a big difference in the musical movement, which we called our Motown sound. Um, it doesn't seem like so long ago. It seems like just yesterday to me. But if you bring up the, the 60s, right away the images come up for me and I remember leaving high school, getting on a bus down West Grand Boulevard and going up to Hitsville, USA, because that's where the action was. That's where Smokey was, that's where the Miracles, Martha Rees and the Vandellas, the Four Tops, the Marvelettes, Marv Johnson at that time, and Barrett Strong, everybody was there and that's where we wanted to be. We wanted to be at Motown. And um, those are some of my memories. I have many wonderful and fond memories. At that time, the 60s, everything seemed possible. We thought that we could change the world through our music. And our music did not start with rebellion and hatred or anger. It really was coming out of love and a togetherness. And working hard and working together and believing in ourselves. And I think that was the spirit of Motown, our family atmosphere, which I, I really think is what made the unit so special, working with Marvin Gaye, singing background with uh, any group that was making a record at that time. And, um, you know, we laughed together, we cried together, we grew up together, and a lot of us traveled different roads. And as I've traveled all over the world, I realize that uh, even in places where I think that our music has not gotten to, I just was recently in East Berlin and over at the Wall, and people know the music over there, and it's very exciting for me to know that our music has traveled all over the world. They cherish Motown, they cherish Holland Dozier Holland and all the songs that were written in the 60s, and their music and the produ productions that they did, and um, so do I. So I'd like to, for a special and a very personal thanks, to Brian Holland, Eddie Holland, Lamont Dozier. I remember coming to the studio and watching you play, and, and Brian was always the one that seemed to be at the piano all the time, and uh, Lamont seemed to be getting the backgrounds and all the melodic sounds together, and Eddie was writing the lyrics, and not just for the Supremes, but for all of us at Motown, and I really want to personally thank them, and I love them, and I'm happy that I could be here to uh, induct them into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> the Brewster Projects turned out to be, no surprise, a hothouse of talent and creativity. Whom did you meet in the Brewster Projects? Florence Ballard and Mary Wilson. Right. They wanted to put together a girls group and they came and they asked my, mo my mother and my father if I could sing with the primates. I had been singing, everybody sings in the neighborhood. You sing uh, all the hit songs on the street, you know, like the doo-wops or whatever you want to call them in the streets, you sing. And they heard I could sing and they asked if I could sing with the group. How old were you at this point? I must have been about 14 maybe. You've said for the next few years singing became my life. I lived, ate, drank and breathed it. How did your parents feel about that? Um, my mom was happy about it. My dad wasn't so happy about it. My dad wanted me to, you know, pay attention to my studies and, uh, you know, get good grades in school. And I would, you know, get on the bus, uh, on the Dexter bus and go up to West Grand Boulevard to Hitsville all the time and uh, try to get Smokey Robinson to listen to my group at that time to see if we could uh, record at Motown. And uh, we went to Motown, and Barry Gordy said, you're too young, go back to school. And so I persevered. What I did is I, I, I got a job working for Barry Gordy as his secretary. <laughs> what does that look mean? <laughs> because I can't type or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, <laughs> Just out of curiosity, what did you do as his secretary? I organized his desk. Okay. <laughs> I was a good organizer. 
No. Uh, you have to have an edge. <laughs> I understand. For the sake of our younger students here at the Actors Studio Drama School of Pace University, what was Motown Records? First of all, it was a, t a tiny little house between two funeral homes. <laughs> Barry Gordy, uh, the owner, I think borrowed $700 from his family to start this record company. And um, he was our manager and he was the mentor and kind of the, the director, um, the person that really gave everyone the inspiration at this company. He gave all the new songwriters a chance and, and he brought all these different singers in, Martha Rees and the Vandella, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, and they would write songs and he would help edit the songs. When I went to do Ed Sullivan and I had to sit, stand up in front of Bob Preck, Barry would say to me, get up there and make it happen. And I would, I had to do it because he told me to. And there was no music. And I would get up and I would sing and I would do everything because he, I believed that he knew the answer. He was an extraordinary, extraordinary man. I wouldn't be here today if he didn't believe in me as um, not only a performer but as an actress. It was a family organization, and they were trying to find names that would really be catchy. They asked us to go away and come up with some other name other than the primates, because they didn't think that that had the right ring to it. And Florence is the one who came back with the name The Supremes. You were what, 16? We must have been 16, yeah. And what was Maurice King's role as your... Maurice charisma? was our musical director, and uh, he taught us how to um, sing on key because none of us had ever, I still have never studied music. I can't read a note. Um, my ears are very important to me. If I can't hear it, I can't uh, sing it. So I have to hear the note. And, um, and I, I don't know how to do any kind of vocal exercises, so I basically protect and take care of my throat. But he, he would teach us how to stay on the note, and he would teach us harmony. Uh, that wasn't really my job. Mary and Florence did the harmony. <laughs> While we're on that subject, what made that? Motown well, sound so Barry made a joke about it because the, the house that, that he lived upstairs and we recorded downstairs, he said it's rats, roaches, guts, and love that uh. helped us get that sound. Didn't they once have you record in a bathroom? Yeah, well, we needed a good... A sound for echo or reverb and so we sang everywhere we would sing in the bathroom we would sing in the hallway we would sing out in the alley <laughs> wherever who wrote and produced most of the early material that you sang Brian Holland yeah. Eddie Holland and Lamont Dozier did Barry write any did Smokey Barry, write any? Barry uh, Smokey did Smokey wrote a song uh, for us I think one of the songs are you just a breathtaking first sight, soul shaking one night, love making next day, heartbreaking guy? <laughs> I like that song. <laughs> <laughs> what was the Supreme's first top 40 hit? When the Love Light Shines Through His Eyes. Which That's one? it. And who wrote that? Um, that was HDH. It was there, Holland Dolly Holland yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. I think they wrote all of our They hits. were remarkable, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, incredible. Two were brothers. Yeah, two brothers. The yeah. Holland brothers. Yeah. Brian was the, you know, the melody and the keyboards, and I think um, uh, Lamont did the backgrounds. I think they all had different specialties. Right. Yeah. You were still being called Diane Ross at this earlier than this. <laughs> Did it, didn't it become formally Diana if you finally reverted to your real name? Well, here's what. If you notice that, Barry changed the uh, titles for all the groups so that we could make more money. How so? Because if there was a, a lead singer and a group, he could ask for more money when he sold one us for the on lead, the road. One for the group? So it was Diana Ross and the Supremes. Martha Rees and the Vandellas, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, and it was like that. Most of the groups, he changed all the names so that, that when he went to sell us, like on the road or any tours or whatever, that he could demand a higher salary. Where did you go on these tours? We went uh, on what they, at that time, may have called the Chitlin Circuit. Did you ever run into any racial issues during your tours in the South? Macon, Georgia was a difficult place. We Didn't got shot, shot at, at there. Yeah. 
as we were traveling through the South, we would find that there was uh, gas stations where the bathrooms were white only or colored only, uh, or water fountains said white and colored only. I do think that things have changed. Yes, they I've are. spent a lot of time in the South since then, and things have changed. A lot of people better. worked hard and suffered a lot yeah. to make them change. What was your first number one song, The Supremes? Where did I love go? <laughs> the 60s literally belonged to The Supremes. Where did our love go was the first of five number one Supreme songs in a row. Here are three very young, very gifted women beginning to catch America's attention. <laughs> Am I correct that Baby Love was the Supreme's most successful single? I don't know. You know, we were so busy traveling and so <clears throat> excited. I think that's what happens is you get so excited just to think that your record is played on the radio. Yeah, I don't think we ever really tried to figure out how many records we were selling. It was just something that you never really imagined that was going to happen to your life. Those were heady times. Yeah. This gracious and beautiful woman has agreed to bring something back to us on our stage right now. Has it ever occurred to you that if you had a dollar for every time that you have sung the word baby in your career, <laughs> you would be the richest woman in America? <laughs> huh? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's permanent collection of 500 songs that shaped rock and roll includes Stop in the Name of Love. We all remember this. Who gave you that? Charlie Atkins did all of the choreography in the early days for all of the performers. We would have dance classes. We had a kind of modeling classes or finishing school classes and um, and then we have our singing classes one of the things Barry decided is that he wasn't going to just take these um, young girls or any of the acts out of the projects he wanted to groom us and ready us for the rest of the world the Supremes had a distinctive look since we know that you studied fashion costume design cosmetology cast tech 
Is it logical to assume that you had a hand in the look of your group? Because I was majoring in fashion design and, and wanted to make costumes, I always made some of the gowns that we had for the early days. Did you actually sew them? Yeah, yeah, I, I can sew. <laughs> We wanted to look like the fashion magazines and be glamorous. We wanted to have beautiful gowns, beautiful shoes, and we would copy the big bouffant teased hair and the makeup and all of that. Who wrote and produced You Can't Hurry Love? Uh, again, that was Brian Holland, Eddie Holland, Lamont Dozier. That song, all of these songs, uh, the melodies are so lasting, like you can still hold on to the melodies of those songs today. They're memorable. You Can't Hurry Love went to number one on Billboard's pop singles chart. It has been included in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's permanent collection of 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. And here is why. <laughs> It's axiomatic and, in a sense, understandable that musical groups from Simon and Garfunkel to the Beatles to the Jackson Five are as fragile and combustible as marriages and families. You've said Mary Wilson, Florence Ballard, and I weren't sisters. But we were almost like that when the Supremes were together. Did Barry Gordy's professional focus on you, because he saw you had a star, and as you say, you wanted a star and a group, did that put a strain on the group? I think uh, as time went on, it was expressed that it did put a strain on them. Uh, at the time, it didn't, I didn't think that it did. Um, I didn't feel that that was uh, the stress point. I thought we were all growing in different directions. I think Florence wanted very much to leave the group and have a family. Um, I felt like it was, we were just growing up and we were just changing direction. And easily could be like a marriage, where sometimes you might need to change direction. Yeah. I don't know that it was really uh, because of Barry's focus on me. Um, I think it was just time. It was part of growing. The 1970s began with the final appearance of Diana Ross and the Supremes at the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas. What was that night like? Oh, that was such a night. It was <laughs> such a night. It was just so charged and emotional. I was leaving the Supremes to go out on my own to start the film career, not knowing whether it was going to be successful or not. It felt good and then it felt scary. It was like taking a step into the unknown. Uh, we just didn't know what was to look forward to. Uh, I know they didn't, I didn't. It was really like stepping into the darkness, not knowing really if it was the right thing to do or not. From BBC Radio News, welcome to South Africa, and Thank thanks you. for taking time out today to chat to the media. Uh, the very que the first question I'd like to ask you is, uh, what memories have you got of the early days of the Supremes, and how do you feel that people still best remember you as Diana Ross and the Supremes? Yes. To me, I know it's been quite a few years, I won't say how many, it's like yesterday. The music is still very vibrant in my life. Um, and so the days of the Supremes in Motown is very much uh, involved in who I am today. Uh, I think the music is still very new because a lot of young people and a lot of people are still listening to the Motown sound and the Supremes. So uh, my memories, I have really wonderful memories. Um, 
just how hard it was to get started. Those are actually good memories today. This has been an incredible, credible journey. I want to thank him, he's in this audience, brilliant and extraordinary, Barry Gordy, for getting me started. For, for believing in me, for getting me started in this industry, for believing in me, and for his great contribution to the music industry. And sometimes I'm not sure that we are all give him the credit that he's due. The Motown family. For the Motown family, for they will always, always be in my heart. So when you honor me, you really honor the Motown legacy. And to all the Supremes, all the Supremes, especially Mary Wilson, I want to really, really send my love out to her.